Hi, everybody. I'm back. Had some glitch. Yes. Hi, Ranjan. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Wonderful to see you after a long time. <laughs> great, great to see you. Yes. Still young. Yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> Uh, so 14 hours per day. <laughs> I know, I know you must be. I know you. <laughs> yeah, I married two hats. Yeah. Pre-land climate scientist and post-land climate bureaucrat. <laughs> it is tough job switching over from one hat to other. <laughs> yeah, I think today is very busy day for all yeah. of us. Yeah. Thank you. Different world. There are a small number of people who are more busy after retirement. Yes, I wish it one of them. He was <laughs> less busy in the job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I become more busy after my retirement. After from retirement. University. Earlier, I was a teacher and scientist only. So they were related you know, jobs. Okay, great. And dresses and for different jobs. Yeah. But it's okay. Uh, so the physically and mentally. Uh, I have decided that I should be working. Yeah, yeah. And that's good. I'm okay. That's why the brain wise. <laughs> so we should we should all be fine and uh, working for for the cause. Yeah, you are also starting green. <laughs> Last I, week, we I survived a fatal accident on 18th and I'm ah. happy to be here alive. Yes. So it's like uh, uh, it's like an, another birth. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm very fine, so absolutely. Uh, I heard about that. No, I yeah. Knew. Also, I knew that you have survived and you are okay now. So I could not uh, I could not trim my bed and all, you see, uh, for, for, <laughs> for the webinar. <laughs> looks good. Okay. So India is one of the 17 countries facing extremely high water stress. The Composite Water Management Index by Niti Ayo states that 40% of the population will have no access to drinking water by 2030. So what will the groundwater reliant population do when the aquifers can no longer be used? A uh, very good afternoon to everyone. I am Devrupa Ghosh, Program Officer at the Center for Studies on Environment and Climate at the Asian Development Research Institute. I will be your host today, taking you through the program. So before we begin, I wish each one of you a very happy International Water Day. To give momentum to this auspicious day, we have organized two special lectures by two eminent speakers on the UN theme of 2022 that is groundwater, making the invisible visible. Kindly note, the participants can put down their questions in the chat box and the speaker shall address them, post their lectures. Taking it ahead, may I now request Professor Prabhat P. Ghosh, Member Secretary, Asian Development Research Institute, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Devupa. It's my daily pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar that organized special lectures to celebrate International Water Day. I'm not an expert on this subject. I happen to be an economist, but I know very well the kind of pressure that the economy is already facing because of the water public issues, challenges. Uh, I come from a district in West Bengal, which is, which is not a Gangetic thing. It's one of those plateau regions of the Western Europe. And I remember in small port town, there were as many as 10 big ponds, which used to serve enormous to be residents of the town. Very recently, I have been there to my town, and only three of them are surviving, and the seven have disappeared, and making it extremely difficult for the people in the, my small town, uh, difficult life for them. If that is the position in my hometown, I can well imagine the kind of problems people are facing world over, especially the plateau region of India. And I, this morning, I, I only heard from Professor Ghosh 
This is not only the plateau region of India. Even the, in the Gangeti plate, we have the problem of lack of water resources, including surface as well as subsurface. Sub 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 Friends, I'm sure, and this is she said, our young colleagues, Vivek, Devilba, uh, Mini, and others are doing their at best to address the issue and help the government on behalf to come up with certain policies which will make our water management more scientific and more sustainable. With these words, I welcome you all again to this special lecture series, and I hope the participants in this webinar will immensely benefited by the lectures by Dr. Ranian and Dr. Sarkos. With these words, I stop here and start. Uh, there we go. Thank you so much, sir. Taking it ahead, may I request Mr. Ranjan Panda, the convener at Water Initiatives Odisha and Combat Climate Change Network, to kindly present his lecture and share his experiences. Sir, kindly okay. unmute yourself. Unmute you. Yeah. Yeah. At this outset, <laughs> let me also wish all of you uh, a very happy World, World Water Day. I don't know how much happy or sad this is, uh, but then uh, each year we celebrate Water Day, uh, you know, more water is under stress and more species are under stress. So we could always be hopeful anyway for people who are still engaged in water, uh, in conservation activities. So I thank uh, the Asian Development Research Institute, the Envy Center, and especially uh, professors <clears throat> and my friend and uh, old friend, Dr. Uh, Ghos and, uh, and Debrupa and all team for inviting me. I think uh, uh, I had said that I will talk, uh, I'll not talk about, uh, approach this topic from a different perspective. Uh, you know, the, the topic this time for the World Water Day is basically uh, how to make the invisible water visible. Uh, you know, if you look into that, then uh, uh, I've been doing a perception mapping of uh, young generation people uh, for some time now. And uh, I was thinking uh, I, to share with you, you know, some of the inputs from there so that you understand or uh, everybody here can actually see groundwater through surface water bodies. So for example, today only I was in a, a college and I asked uh, the local youths, uh, you know, if I, if I happen to ask you to prepare a waterscape of your city, of a neighborhood, so what, what normally do you see? So, you know, what is visible? So I think, for, you know, ironically, I would say, and uh, unfortunately, and this has been the trend, uh, you know, now bottled water and tap is more visible than, uh, you know, the surface water bodies and the rivers. So, you know, uh, out of the 300 odd students, they were there, only one student actually said, talked about Mahanadi, the uh, largest river here, the lifeline, and only four to five uh, students actually, they talked about uh, the water body, surface water body in their uh, neighborhood. Rest of them, except for two or three who talked about a tube well, uh, you know, uh, and without, of course, linking that to the groundwater, uh, people talked about the water tankers, uh, water tanks uh, of, of the municipality, of, of the water supply agency. So, uh, you know, this is how, if we want to understand, India is a young country and the new generation is, uh, is actually going to take charge of our you know, water governance uh, very soon. And there is an intergenerational, you know, intergenerational uh, sort of transition that should have happened, but actually uh, the ground reality is completely different. So uh, I want to discuss this uh, because we want, we want to make groundwater visible. Uh, that's, that, that applies for policymakers, that applies for farmers, that applies for industries, and that apply, applies for your city, city governments, and of course, the rural uh, water supply agencies as well. So, but then uh, the, the, the surface water body that does a lot of service 
to recharge ground water is also not visible so it's it's visible how it's visible as a dumping yard it's visible as a, a garbage pit it's visible as a market yard it's visible as a apartment so you know uh, uh, you know the kind of uh, climate change impacts that we see now uh, we we don't realize that uh, the ground water recharging uh, ability of surface water bodies so i think uh, you know it is very important uh, to understand that india has a very rich tradition of uh, you know harvesting rainwater because that's that's actually uh, you know lifeline for recharging ground water as far as i i understand and uh, and we don't uh, uh, and we 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 forget the carriers we forget the carriers we want to make ground water visible uh, which is in fact asok ji will say uh, how how contaminated and how stressed that is already india in fact is the largest you know user user of ground water and uh, but then uh, but then are we losing the opportunities are we losing the opportunities that that we have in uh, in in our own resources in, in our own traditional knowledge uh, systems so i think that's the reason i i preferred uh, to to talk on this topic uh, today so uh, thank you so much i i will now i'm sorry due to my accident i i could not find time to prepare a presentation for all of you but then i will i just jotted down some points and and accordingly i'll try to make it uh, you know a presentation within my time frame so you know uh, it is said that the health of our water is a principal measure of how we live on the land uh, luna leopards uh, leopold so that you know said that so that that shows you know the society that we live in is it is it actually having a pos you know what kind of perception it has on water and what kind of uh, respect it actually gives uh, to the water that is visible now ground water is, is invisible nobody respects it you know and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we have like ample uh, uh, ground water commons with us we have uh, almost 225 rivers 7500 km long coastline lakes ponds springs and and uh, you know uh, you know various level of aquifers the ground water aquifers and all but then uh, but then that's a rich uh, country in that sense india is a rich country but do we actually do we respect have we actually missed the bus somewhere uh, almost uh, 54 to 60% of india now faces high to extreme high water stress and then uh, just in i think 8 years if we go then you know the the amount of water that will be available for us to use uh, the demand will be almost like uh, 200% like the 50% availability of what we will uh, you know what we will be needing so are we uh, are we actually understanding the value of water that is uh, that is uh, that is you know bestowed on on us our, our geographies and uh, i i don't think that if you see the climate change projections the latest ipcc report if you see some of the uh, you know some of the portions that uh, they are, they are asking us not to quote now but are very uh, you know very very scary uh, see is how uh, our surface water bodies our oceans actually that temperature is increasing and and uh, very fast in the kind of statistics they are rolling out is like you know scientifically with with a lot of evidence shows that actually we are squeezing our water resources in in multiple ways we are not only destroying them we are not only encroaching upon them but we are actually uh, making the diversity making the biodiversity making the surrounding of those such concretized so, you know wherever even we are reviving water bodies we are reviving them with so much of grey infrastructure around that you know the kind of temperature uh, that we are creating around them is further destroying further creating uh, so lakes and water bodies temperature is also like now we have lot of evidences lot of evidences uh, segregated evidences on how much temperature rise is happening in the sea how much temperature rise is, is happening in the lakes how many lakes are actually suffering uh, from quality and you know quantity issues and how you know Uh, so so looking at all that are we actually going to be 
in 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 a soup are we going to be uh, facing the sixth uh, mass extinction i'm very sure yes so so i think the, you know linking what local water linking ground water or linking surf, surface water has uh, has has to do with uh, the kind of food we are eating the kind of food production we are uh, confronted with food production challenges the kind of water supply challenges we are uh, you know uh, confronted with so we have to we have to actually link that to everything so the perception battle are are our water bodies losing the perception battle especially of uh, the current generation people i have seen yes so they they are no they are no more in their perception as you can see the the water scape water scape is actually getting squeezed into you know bottles taps it's good that we are providing water at uh, you know those steps but that we should also have enough you know uh, education enough awareness the jal jeevan mission and uh, everything is in fact trying to do a lot of rejuvenation recharging and trying to raise awareness and other programs are there but but so far we see this is not enough and we have lost something very very critical very crucial and very important in in, in the line and uh, that is the knowledge of indian societies indian communities that we had to actually understand rain understand uh, rain water harvesting in in their local geographies so i think that is exactly where we have to now uh, understand but uh, let us go into a bit of statistics on how much uh, actually uh, uh, pollution we have just a bit for example we have already 70% of all our surface water sources are now polluted i am not going to encroachment in you know by by you know several factors and we only treat uh, somewhere around 30% of our sewage and so uh, half of the groundwater reserves are you know contaminated in this country causing diseases death and and what not so uh, many sources that are, that we are dependent on for our drinking water and other purposes purposes are actually very much contaminated so who else can uh, then asok ji can actually say about that so uh, so that is where the question lies so are we respecting the water body are we uh, have we destroyed them uh, more than enough is there a chance to revive uh, you know i am very hopeful i think uh, uh, only thing is that we need to be very willing we need to be actually working with uh, all all across the society and most importantly something that i have been saying for the last few years uh, is with the uh, youth the youth have to actually now understand the value of water because they they don't have uh, uh, their their knowledge on water is actually getting unless and otherwise someone is involved in a technical education or on trying you know in some kind of initiatives overall i see there is a degradation of uh, value you know a perception on values of water so on on water the understanding is getting completely you know uh, getting you know shrinking completely so that is that is a danger we have to work out and we we have to be hopeful but we have to be very much you know into the job and try to engage youth in respecting water in understanding the water scapes uh, much better and and what else then you know your uh, surface water bodies can actually teach them uh, the the importance of water and you know in in not only harvesting rain water uh, in not only you know uh, combating climate change through absorbing more flood waters and in in providing all other ecological services but also in recharging ground water so that that perception i think is one of the toughest task but very important task that we need to now carry on so india for example if we look into the geographies of india then we have like 16 different ecological regions uh, each region has its own traditional methods of conserving water and harvesting rain so that's something we are slowly slowly missing because our perceptions are getting into just some rivers some lakes and uh, and you know uh, taps and bottles so that's exactly what i am trying to say and emphasizing again and again that we are losing something uh, india is known for its diversity ecologically socioculturally economically uh, you know you know 
uh, we, we should not forget that. We should not actually lose sight of the importance of all this. And once we do that, I think we'll be losing a big opportunity. Just everybody cannot talk about one kind of water solution. Each region cannot actually find one kind, one type of water solution. That's not the answer. So we, uh, people have their own relationship, their own understanding on rainfall, and they have their own traditions on harvesting water. And that's exactly is also one of the best methods to actually uh, uh, combat climate change in, in, in this country, because water cycle, as we all know, is the most impacted uh, thing due to climate change. And water is where the most of the adaptation action has also to be taken. So I think that is where uh, we need to work on this. And uh, just I'll give you some glimpse of how India is, how rich, and what kind of water traditions are there. So you have, uh, you know, different kind of structures. They're called the baulis uh, in, in Rajasthan. They're called, you know, uh, katas, bans, mudas uh, in, in, in Odisha, several parts of Odisha in Central Highlands. Then you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gujarat has different kind of structures. You have, uh, there are several temples across in South India. You see a large tanks are there. So you have a lot of lot of kind of structures. I would have shown you the photographs, uh, some of the photographs, but then today I could not make a presentation of that. But uh, my point here is, uh, you know, can we can we actually uh, a term that is now being uh, very much uh, you know being talked about is can we actually go uh, vocal for local in this uh, in water? Can we actually talk about uh, how important the different sizes and uh, different types and different you know region specific water harvesting structures and systems so these are not only structures because because many a times uh, you know in in in, in the uh, rust to revive water bodies to create more water bodies even under the mgnreg also we are creating a lot of water bodies many a times we forget two three things we forget that you know, just digging a pond is not the solution. And we also forget one phenomenon that you know, just not having a structure, not having water in summer is actually not a failed structure. So it should not be converted into a dumping yard. So in, in tropical ecosystems, this is just natural that some of the structures might, might be dry during summer, but they still have ecological functions. They still, have, they still host a lot of you know, microorganisms, moistures. So, so these are the kind of understanding we actually need to now build. So water is no everything doesn't look like a sea. So there are tanks, there are large tanks, 300 acres, 400 acres, 500 acres, and much more like the gold, like the Hyderabad Nagarjun Sagar you have seen, like the Rani, uh, uh, you know, Talab in Jabalpur. So, you know, some of these jails you see, they're very huge, but you also see, you know, one acre, one and a half acre, less than that so th there are also kinds of ponds so we have a lot of structures in odisha we call them the kata many of them ha have also been you know transformed into minor irrigation projects because they are huge they their water holding capacity is much more than the normal water bodies the small water bodies but but everything geographically everywhere like in the steppe wells for example in rajasthan so everywhere they have their own local geoecological significance and they have been built with traditional knowledge a lot of science was there in tradition as well and we have stopped in a way respecting those uh, you know many a times we have not we were not in fact bringing up those knowledge back to be integrated in our plannings so i think my my point today is we should actually start thinking about that we should involve these people we should we should look look around where are they who who build those structures what kind of history is actually where they are, are behind these structures so what kind of ge geoecological specifications they had and why one structure holds water in the same place why one the same kind of structure doesn't hold water, hold water in the same place so this kind of understandings it's not an engineering solution the crux of my talk is water harvesting is not just an engineering solution. It's a socio-religious, ecological, geological, 
and you know uh, in a solution so one has to understand water through all these perspectives one has to understand that we cannot have uh, you know we cannot recharge our ground water we cannot create water security we cannot combat you know fight against climate change just by uh, you know large uh, irrigation structures dams and you know kind of other uh, engineering solutions we have to go the natural way we have to go the traditional way in many places wherever wherever uh, you know uh, success uh, many initiatives have been taken you know new uh, new intelligence uh, knowledge technology have been embedded with traditional knowledge i think lot of success has happened we have ourselves done a lot of such initiatives in odisha and uh, and in many villages you know besides ensuring water security we have ensured food security we have ensured that migration has has been has reversed you know distressed migration and kind of uh, these kind of efforts have have been happening throughout the uh, country so my uh, you know my suggestion is we should involve uh, local people we should map uh, map again the kind of traditional knowledge people have even something that i keep on saying now it is because many people are migrating to cities because of several things so we are losing uh, in in the cities we get them as only laborers construction laborers and and maids and all but then if we actually can also map out there are many of these people who have been pioneers in forest protection they understand mm -hmm. species much better than many scientists they 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 know the local ecological importance of many species many of these knowledge we are losing they they have uh, you know pond digging uh, knowledge they have the geo ecological knowledge of where to dig a pond so that water will always be there so which kind of structure is suitable for which geography so even the cities should now start mapping the the skills the traditional knowledge and skills that these people bring to them so it should not go wasted and that should then be transformed to the uh, new generation so in my opinion uh, you know uh, courses should be opened in in universities and colleges to to be able to tap traditional water harvesting knowledge in india you have got amples of uh, information on that in the website i don't have to tell about all the kind of structures uh, you know books like aaj bhi khare hain talab by anupam misra ji uh, can can teach a lot about you know all that but then the idea here is we we should not we should no more ignore the traditional uh, you know water harvesting systems knowledge and structures and uh, this should be very much embedded into our planning process the modern planning process along you know with, with the technologies new technologies to be able to bring in better solutions they they cannot uh, they may not be suitable all all the traditional knowledge may not be sufficient for the kind of crisis we now have but then they can definitely provide a lot of substance and and, and strengthen the foundation of our planning and our uh, uh, you know uh, activities our actions water actions and climate actions so i think i think with that i will i will uh, you know end my case here any questions are most welcome thank you so much thank you so much Like for really helping us understand like how diverse our subcontinent is and how in the present day we really need to think about the traditional uh, water management practices, region specific like you mentioned. Thank you so much sharing your for sharing your experiences. So for the next uh, lecture, may I now request Professor Ashok Kumar Ghosh, Chairman of the Bihar Pollution Control Board, Department of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of Bihar. to uh, please take thank you so uh, thanks to all of you for joining this webinar thanks to ghosla for inviting us here and also it's wonderful to see my old friend ranjan after a long time of course in the virtual world 
uh, already uh, the background has been set by Ranjan Ji about the importance of the traditional water management systems and the problems that we are going to face. My focus will be slightly different from his focus because uh, I'm working on water quality uh, almost now more than 25 years. And when I saw the title of the, uh, this year's theme, World Water Day theme, groundwater making invisible visible. So it is very close to my heart because my most of, most of the work that I've done is related to groundwater. And when you see the groundwater through your naked eyes, it looks very clean, very pristine, and, and, and no harm, no, nothing harmful appears in that. But if you go deep, you get many things that are hidden. And since my uh, career in water management, I'm trying to highlight that what is hidden in the groundwater that you cannot see, but how harmful they can be. So just to begin with uh, presentations, I have some slides that I will share, like to share with you. And also I'll skip some of the slides uh, because I didn't have the time to edit them. So maybe a few slides I will skip to save time. First of all, uh, I'll go to slides. So yeah, not a slide so there. Yeah. So this is the first slide before you, regarding which Ranjanji also highlighted. Uh, according to Population Action International, more than 2.8 billion people in 48 countries will face water stress or scarcity condition by 2025. We are already in 2022. So 2025 is not far. Then over the two decades, population increases and growing demands are projected in push all the West Asian countries into water scarcity conditions. Things are going bad to worse. And it is projected by UNFPA that by 2050, the number of countries facing water stress or scarcity could rise to 54 with a combined population of 4 billion out of 7.5 billion on the earth, about 40% of the projected global population of 9.4 billion. The estimate is variable. We say, somebody say that it has touched 9.8 billion, some say 9.4 billion. But one thing is for sure that it is already across the 7 billion mark. And it is estimated that if we allow the population growth as it is today, and also we don't change the lifestyle, then by the end of this uh, century, there will be 11 billion people on the earth. And there are only one earth for our own resources, whether it is water resources or the food, everything, space, and everything required that has to be catered by only one earth. That is the biggest problem. And not only that, you have three photographs before you of India, coming back to India, where uh, the first one, the left one at the top, it says that 50% of India already is facing high and extremely high water scarcity, water stress. That is a huge number, all the red area, that you know more than 50% of the area that is having the red color, they have the water stress. Similarly, 50%, 54% of groundwater wells are decreasing. Uh, I was talking to Ghosla just before starting this lecture. Uh, in North Bihar, uh, we, we, we heard uh, right from our childhood that North Bihar is full of water bodies, many rivers, wetlands, awareness of groundwater and everything. And even North Bihar, district like Darbhanga, it has become water stressed. There was a time two years back when water was supplied in tankers in Darbhanga. We never imagined that a district like Darbhanga will have water stress. And then if you go to another, uh, another photo, uh, uh, the map of India here, yeah, more than 100 million people live in area of poor water quality. Only quantity is not important, but quality is also important. And if you say that 100 million people are exposed to poor water quality, and that is not visible. Water, water in the groundwater, there are so many contaminants, but that is not visible. So I will try to make them visible through my studies that I've done in my career. And the, all the forecasts identify 2030 as the year of great thirst. And 2030 is not far again. We are already in 2022. 
and by 2030, the year of great thirst is nearby. So our generation people are going to face it. He's not talking about next generation now. Even for our generation people, things are knocking at our door. And we have to re the policy has to be changed to, to adjust to the new, new normal. That is the word, buzzword coming nowadays, that you have to accept the realities and adjust your life to the new, new normal. That is the, uh, the objective. And uh, if you talk about Bihar, that I'm talking in groundwater quality, uh, Bihar has lots of groundwater. We have three levels of aquifers. A shallow aquifer at the depth of about 40 to 50 feet, a middle aquifer that is at the depth of 150 feet, and deep aquifer at the depth of, depth of 280, 90 onwards. So we have abundance of water. But side by side, all through Bihar, we have all sort of quality problems. You talk of any problem and we have it. Whether you talk about arsenic, nitrate, fluoride, iron, manganese, pesticide, emerging organic, organic con contaminants, microplastics, and even <coughs> uranium. We have published a paper recently, earlier it was thought that uranium is not in Bihar, but now it is confirmed through our studies in collaboration with the University of Manchester. And we have published a paper also that in Bihar also some of the districts that the presence of uranium. Earlier it was thought that uranium is confined to Dharkand in Jaduguda mines area. But now it is confirmed through our study, we are trying to find the region, the source from where it is coming. But it's sure that there are many areas where even uranium is there. Uh, there are so many continents that it's very difficult to accommodate all the contaminants in, in half an hour time. So I will touch uh, limited ones. I will talk about a bit about arsenic, then fluoride, that's the second thing. Then microplastics, that is very emerging contaminants. And also the POP, persistent organic pollutants, that is less visible till now. And now it is coming up slowly. Uh, this is map of Bihar. If you see the Bihar map, all the areas, if they're either green or orange or whatever, everywhere there's some problem is there. This map has been done for only three things, arsenic, chloride, and iron. And if you only consider these three contaminants, whole Bihar is covered. We have other continents also, but if you consider only arsenic and fluoride and iron, all 38 districts are somewhat water infected with any of them, not all of them at a time, but some of the contaminants are there. Like out of 38 districts in Bihar, uh, 18 districts, they have high level of arsenic below the, beyond the permissible level. 12 districts, they have high range of fluoride and almost 30 districts, 30 to 31 districts, they have a presence of the iron. So that way, uh, water quality is ch challenge everywhere. Some problem or other is there. And that is creating a huge problem. Normally, when we started, we, 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 earlier, you know, when I was a child, uh, our drinking water source was not the groundwater. It was open well or river water. And we're happy with that and healthy with that. But slowly, you know, people said that the surface water has high diarrheal content. The di diarrhea, the bacterial contamination is very high. So surface water should not be touched. The different world bodies like UNICEF and WHO and World Bank, they, they suggested that in developing countries, there is high incidence of diarrhea in kids and mortality in diarrhea in kids due to so use of surface water with high bacterial load. So they promoted the groundwater. The groundwater is good. There is no bacteriological contamination. It will be safe for drinking purpose. And without further scientific study, People shifted from surface water to groundwater. And we, even we, we had adopted groundwater uh, very fast due to convenience. The two reasons of convenience, it was readily available in, in almost all parts of India at that time. And second, the water looked very clear and pristine, very, very clear and pristine. You know, the contaminants like arsenic and fluoride, if they are there in uranium, even, they're not visible in water. So we thought that we have got a wonderful water. So everybody shifted from surface water to groundwater. And results came slowly. By the use of this rampant use of groundwater, we, we got many problems one by one, starting from first one, that is arsenic in groundwater. That was a big challenge. I have worked a lot on this area. We have tested, my research group has tested more than 46,000 hand pumps in Bihar 
from point to point. And almost 30% of them, uh, they have high content of uh, arsenic in groundwater. That is more than 10 microgram uh, per liter. That is the permissible limit of uh, recommended by WHO for drinking water. And you will be amazed to know that in Bihar itself, in the district of Baksar, we have recorded highest value of arsenic in groundwater that is 1906 micrograms per liter. So you can imagine that if the permissible limit is 10 micrograms per liter only, and your drinking water has 1906 micrograms per liter of arsenic in your water, then what impact it will have on your health? Anybody can imagine that is huge. It's not there that every hand pump has uh, 1906 micrograms per liter, that is maximum value. And 30% of hand pumps are contaminated. That was the figure that we have recorded. And the impact is visible. You know, uh, right now I'm working at two places. I'm working as chairman of Bihar State Personal Control Board. And at the same time, I'm working as head of the research department of Mahavir Cancer Hospital. The impact of arsenic is visible every day in that cancer, cancer hospital. Many patients are coming with cancer of skin, cancer of gallbladder, cancer of liver, with the symptoms of arsenicosis. I will try to show you some, some figures and diagrams that what is the statistics worldwide as far as arsenic is concerned and what is the impact about that. This is a, a, a 2016 statement by WHO, way long back, we are in 2022. And in uh, 2016, WHO made this statement that the largest mass poisoning of population in history is arsenic exposure. It was stated that arsenic exposure appears linked to increase in cancer, heart diseases, and development problems. Way long back in 2016, this was declared, stated by WHO. And uh, as, as of today, it is not the uh, arsenic ingestion only for drinking water. We have worked a lot on food chain because even for irrigation, we are dependent on groundwater. And irrigation water also has high level of arsenic. And what happens that the irrigation, through irrigation water, arsenic enters into food chain. And through food chain, it enters into the body. So if you're drinking water with arsenic and eating food with arsenic, your disease burden is high and you are, you are exposed to very high level of a threat as far as your health is concerned. And this is worldwide distribution. Don't say, don't think that it, this problem is confined to only India and Bangladesh. If you see brown or deep brown area along the globe, whether it is India or Africa, China, USA, Australia, all of them, Africa even, all continents have some problem related with arsenic in groundwater. It is a huge problem. And if you see some data, that is mind boggling, that is mind boggling. Just for your reference, if you see the second point, second bullet, arsenic contamination of groundwater is one of the most serious environmental health disaster occurred in India. And see the figure, out of estimated 10 million arsenic exposed population, nearly 1 million are showing various forms of clinical infestations, including cancer. I was talking about my health hospital. We have many patients with the problem of cancer, skin cancer, and gallbladder cancer, and that is uh, possible due to ingestion of arsenic containing, containing to water. And Bangladesh is also affected, and there are 35 million to 77 million people in Bangladesh, they could be at risk of drinking water with unsafe level of arsenic. And even Pakistan, uh, a recent study uh, suggests Pakistan might be grappling with own arsenic emergency, with up to 60 million people exposed to contaminated water. There is a huge number for one country, a small country like Pakistan. And in 2019, WHO estimated that worldwide 220 million people, see the number, worldwide 220 million people are exposed to concentrations exceeding the WHO limit. And most of them live in Bangladesh, India, Vietnam, and Nepal. The worst affected countries are India, Bangladesh, and even Pakistan. Nepal is comparatively less that these three countries, they are high on the map. And if you talk about Bihar, if you come to Bihar scenario, if you see Bihar scenario, this is the map prepared by my research group, where we have 38 districts, and a total of 18 arsenic districts are affected. 
and most of the affected districts are on the two sides of the river Ganga, north side and the south side. And some of the districts in the Terai area also, like East Champaran and West Champaran, and also Nepal. So these are the scenario as far as Bihar and world uh, is concerned with reference to arsenic. We have completed a research paper recently, uh, Indo-UK research project, in which we have established that arsenic has entered in food chain already. And at least we have confirmed that in raw rice, in cooked rice, in water, in whole wheat, in potato, wheat flour, we have tested all of them in the different parts of Bihar. And we have, we have confirmed that the level of arsenic has increased even in the rice, in the wheat and potato, that is common food. So if you are drinking this water, the water with high arsenic, like 156 microgram per liter, and you are eating raw rice with 230 microgram, and also potato, and also wheat flour, so on and so forth, and then disease burden will increase. So we have submitted this report to Bihar government also to rethink about the irrigation pattern, the irrigation mechanism. We have to shift from uh, groundwater to surface water. Because till now, the river waters, they don't have arsenic. The open well water, they don't have arsenic. So somewhere we have to revive the traditional irrigation system, the Ahar well system that was prevalent in Bihar, where the surface water can be channelized and that surface water won't have arsenic load that, that can enter into food chain. So double problem is there. The food is one problem, water is another problem, and they're all aggravating. So that has to be reviewed and policies has to be changed. Yeah, that has to be changed. And if you talk about health, I won't discuss much. Often people ask me that what arsenic can do. And my answer is that, that better you ask what arsenic cannot do. If you see the, the, the human body uh, from top head to toes, all areas are affected. Mental retardness is there, lung, COPD, cancer, that is possible. GI tract, indigestion and cancer in skin hyperkeratosis, in eye irritation and terigium, nerve peripheral neuropathy, liver cancer, kidney and urinary and bladder cancer, and reduced sperm count leading to infertility. So you can imagine how much disturbance it can do in your body, how much impact it can have in your body as far as metabolism is concerned. And not only that, if you see the next one, next slide, uh, this is a slide that I've taken from uh, Mahavir Cancer Hospital, uh, that, uh, that is the data related to number of patients in one hospital. And if you see the graphs, starting from 1998 to 2017, we have to update it by 2022. The number of cancer patients is increasing year by year. Last year in our hospital, in one hospital, about 25,000 new cancer patients were admitted. I don't say that all the cancers are caused by drinking water. But drinking water is also causing cancer. Arsenic, uranium, other contaminants, they're also causing cancer. And this number is increasing, that is alarming in number, very high in number. So that is something unusual. And we are taking even the, the samples of different parts of the body, arsenic in water. We have found the correlation. We have the real data for the patients with cancer. Where if you see the first name, Jagannath Kesri, he, he is a person with squamous cell carcinoma of skin. And we measured arsenic in his drinking water, 826 microgram per liter, against 10 microgram per liter of uh, arsenic in drinking water, WHO limit. In blood, 63.4. In arsenic in hair, 2,549 microgram per liter. And in nail, 34.24. So that is clear correlation that in carcinoma cells and water, the correlation is there between arsenic concentration and the health outcomes. That is for different patients. We have hundreds of data. I won't go in details. But yeah, we have evidence to prove that arsenic is carcinogenic and is causing gallbladder cancer and other things. Then I will skip a few slides here because this is a more uh, scientific information. Uh, one thing I would like to add here that how it becomes carcinogenic. Actually, when it enters in your body, through the effect of metabolic activity inside the body through enzyme system, arsenic is modified in organic forms like methyl ethyl arsenic acid, dimethyl arsenic acid, and also trimethyl 
methyl arsine, DMA and TMA. And these chemicals that they produce, they, they modify the DNA for giving wrong signals. And by modifying the DNA, the cells become cancerous. So they're targeted. So now it is confirmed that what is the route through which this works and how the uh, arsenic is caused. And some genes have been also identified. Already two genes have been confirmed that we are studying ABCB4 and ABCB1 gene. These genes are attacked by arsenic and through that attack, the cells become carcinogenic and cause this cancer. There are a few symptoms, I will skip fast because the, 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 it's not very good to look at them. It is very adverse impact as far as arsenic is there. Whatever photographs you see here, they're all due to ingestion of arsenic containing water and food. And it is very torturous because there is no uh, medicine till now for curing these problems. Only cure is that you drink arsenic safe water and eat food rich in uh, uh, vitamins, green fruits and milk and eggs. But there's no medicine worldwide to, to, to cure this, these issues, these problems that you can see in the photographs. Vividly described in all these photographs, there are the real photographs of patients coming to our hospital. They all have cancer and also the symptoms of arsenicosis, and that is very heart wrenching. So that is one the story of the arsenic. Coming to the fluoride, that is another issue. In Bihar, North Bihar area and the Gangetic Plain area, they have arsenic problem. And if you go towards Harkhand, in the Hard Rock area, there is no arsenic. But it not means that the water is safe. There is a the problem of fluoride in that area. In the Nawada area, Gaya area, that is closer to the Harkhand border, we have, don't have arsenic problem, but we have fluoride problem. And again, this is the mark. You see the bottom area, the bottom area of Bihar that is close to the Jharkhand border, they all have the problem of fluoride. So they have distributed, you know, among themselves that you take some area, I take some area. Arsenic is the big brother with 18 districts, and fluoride is comparatively younger brother with only 11 districts that is having the prevalence of fluoride. And many, many districts like Kea, uh, Nawada, Rohtas, Katihar, Munger, they all, Bhagalpur even, they all have problem of this uh, high concentration of fluoride. So one problem or other is there. And fluoride is also impacting the health, particularly of children, through dental fluorosis, skeletal fluorosis, and non-skeletal fluorosis. I have some photographs with me of innocent children uh, affected not by any disease, but by affected by drinking water. You can see the, the legs of these two children. That is not all due to, that is not a, uh, in, in, uh, they were not born with this problem. This was caused by the ingestion of the fluoride containing water. You see the whole range of small kids, they all have bent legs, not straight legs, if you see the maniacally. And it's not fault of any bacteriological infection or viral infection. It is due to ingestion of arsenic containing, uh, fluoride containing water. And see, all the boys, the young kids, they have deformities in the bone. And in later stages, they won't be able to walk even. And they will have the loss of livelihood. So these problems are again rampant as far as fluorosis is concerned. Many, many photographs are there impacting, even teeth is impacted and legs are impacted. All photographs, they say that they're, they're caused by the problem of fluoride contamination in groundwater. And uh, permissible limit is 1 to 1.5 uh, ppm. And we have recorded up to 16 ppm of fluoride in the groundwater. So that is a big threat again. That is a big threat again. And not only these two, if you move from uh, these two, the major ones, we have uranium in groundwater. That is another problem, third problem. And this problem we got by chance. We are combing groundwater throughout Bihar for arsenic, not for uranium. But uh, earlier we used to test them through atomic absorption spectrometer. This time we used ICPMS. And ICPMS, if you put your sample, then it, it, it profiles all the contaminants. And when the profile came, we saw, well, some of the districts are having even uh, uranium with high distribution. So that was a chance discovery. We were not targeting uranium, but we got uranium by accident. And see here, see here, 
the maps before you. You have, if you compare the upper map and lower map, upper map is for arsenic area and lower map is for uranium. The higher the size of the blue area or red area, higher the arsenic content or, or uranium content. See here, all these blue zones, they're high in uranium. And all these red zones here, they're high in arsenic. And uh, everybody knows that if, if you ingest water with uranium, you have huge problem. Again, some of the findings I've shared that I'd like to tell you, the groundwater concentration, uranium concentration, ranging from one to 80 microgram per liter with 7% of samples exceeding the WHO provisional guideline of 30 microgram per liter. That we have reported in Bihar. And that is a serious issue. And most of them are near the two river beds, Ghagra and Gandhar. The other two rivers were is very high. And you all know that uranium is so harmful. It is so toxic for human body. And the Atomic Energy Regulation Board has set a radiology-based limit of 60 microgram per liter. And this is exceeding now. It is going once again in the food chain, like arsenic. Then after uranium, arsenic and chloride, we have microplastic. <coughs> that is another problem. You know, microplastic is non-biodegradable. But if you leave the microplastics in the water or soil for a long time period, very, very long time period, they start to break down into small pieces, very, very small pieces. And they're, if their size is below five microns, it's microplastic. And microplastic interest in the food chain. And from food chain, it goes human body. And if it goes in human body, it becomes carcinogenic. So this is another threat coming from groundwater that is not visible. We cannot see the microplastics by naked eyes, but it is visible through electron microscopy. And that is going to be a future challenge. Microplastics, they are a future challenge. And another class of coming that is very less studied, emerging organic contaminants. That is the last one that I will highlight before you. That is another thing that is coming, like pharmaceutical waste in groundwater, cosmetic products in groundwater. We have recently published a paper, research paper on emerging contaminants in Patna district. The rampant use of medicine in Bihar. You know, uh, lots of medicines are prescribed by doctor, uh, doctors for even ordinary problems. And uh, human body usually retains only 10% of the medicine that you, you, you ingest. Rest of them, they're released uh, through urine or other excreta. And that goes in the surface water and then it goes to groundwater. And this is another class on which we have started working, emerging contaminants. And already we have identified this number that is a very alarming number. A total of 73 emerging organic contaminants were detected in 51 samples. That was our study. And that is very, very, you know, challenging. Not much study has been done, but if, if you take overdose of medicine, that is going to harm you certainly going to harm you. And you will see some of the examples, the names that are very common with you, that you commonly use, like medical and veterinary compounds, sulfomethodoxin, dapsons, all medicines, diplofenac, we commonly use medicine. We have all found in groundwater. And if they're all in groundwater and you're a healthy person, and you're drinking with this medicine that is used, you are, you are again challenging your health. Your health will be impacted. So there are so many things that we have to see. And then after highlighting these four, there are so many that I cannot discuss all of them in a short lecture, but at least you know the four things that I've highlighted today, arsenic, chloride, microplastic, and emerging contaminants, new con contaminants. So where, what should be our priorities? To conclude, what should be our priorities? One will be control of indiscriminate groundwater uses. That is first thing. We have to make a balance between the groundwater and surface water, match specific water demands to quality needed, maximize use of reclaimed water at site, sustain resources for technology, training, and infrastructure, enforce healthy land use policy, attention on agriculture and industry policy has to be changed, emphasis on water education. Everybody should be educated. And identification of groundwater recharge areas as suggested by, suggested by them. And that is to conclude, I always say that yes, uh, 
water resource matters because uh, survival of this civilization matters civilization matters thank you very much for your patience for hearing me yeah so that was my presentation thank you for your patient patience for tolerating me my lecture for such a long time uh, yeah i hand over to you thank you so much sir for your insights on the decreasing quality of ground water like over time because like like you pointed out it was quite striking to know we never uh, usually uh, look at we judge ground water seeing its transparency or clear clear crystal like water but we never happen to understand the type of contaminants in it so indeed that was quite striking from your lecture and also the data presented by you uh, of the contaminants it was really scary so i think the time has come we all rethink and uh, the policy makers and uh, the government also take up necessary actions so thank you so much sir uh, now uh, we'll open up for the question answer uh, uh, round uh, the participants if you have any questions you can put them on the uh, chat box okay, we can address so we have a question how can we save groundwater through using our own effort i think ranjan will take this question yeah ranjan you got the question you are muted ranjan okay i will take up uh, this question uh the best way uh, to conserve the ground water was suggested by ranjan already in his talk that we have to develop a mechanism for ground water recharge at the centralized level in my opinion uh, actually not in my opinion i already made this policy as chairman of the <laughs> state forest control audience is not there Yeah, can you listen to me? Then, Rupa, can you people hear me? I am having some issues with internet. It seems. Yeah, I'm listening now. We are. We are. We are listening now. The okay, question, okay. question was about the uh, protecting the groundwater. I was giving the answer. Yeah, I think. I was okay, giving. Okay, I think I. I yeah. missed. I yeah. missed it for some time. So, I think yeah, we have already highlighted this. There are. uh there are basically several layers of intervention that that requires at the moment one is uh, basically policy level intervention as uh, professor gosh was saying and i was also highlighting so policy level actually the problem is india critically has uh, sort of we are having lot of issues with the ground water policies at the moment so i think that needs to be sorted out and uh, and then uh, at the local level uh, as uh, uh, as as what has been said by professor gosh i think we need principles in almost all the water sets and uh, and you know water recharging uh, should be a part of uh, uh, the water use uh, mapping it, it should not be like you know you just go on using and you don't recharge so that is that is one and the use patterns would also be like equitably balanced between different sources that is one so they the, the cycling process in fact can uh, uh, can recharge a lot of reuse and recycling and and then also uh, can also be used then there there is this new uh, you know method of uh, you know, constructed uh, wetlands and kind of other things natural water bodies uh, should be protected and they they help a lot in recharging and sustaining ground water resources uh, 
new technologies are also emerging. Uh, I am not an expert on that, but I have been reading and trying to understand. Is that you have to do a lot of recycling and reusing, and also uh, a lot of that can be used in new new constructed you know ecologies, wetlands, and all. So so there's a lot of a uh, lot of issues. But at, but at the end, I think for sustainable sustainability of any initiative, as I said, we need to involve the local communities. It's only not uh, academics or not experts, uh, but together, together, and and the local communities also have a lot of knowledge on uh, you know you know local resources, and in fact, vast knowledge on that. So integrating their knowledge, their traditions into modern systems, modern technology and modern science is very important. So I think it's an integrated approach that we all need. Yeah, I agree with you, Ranjit. Uh, there are so many traditional knowledge available for managing the groundwater and surface water. I never say that you, you never consider any modern system. It is important to integrate the modern systems with the traditional system. The traditional systems may be upgraded by the use of new technology and new knowledge that we have got. But what we did, that we totally abandoned the traditional wisdom. And we went for only groundwater exploitation. And that led to this crisis. We had a very good system of irrigation, our current system, that only used the rainwater and surface water, never the groundwater. And in the whole Bihar, it was, you know, a very well developed irrigation system. And that is why despite scanty rain, uh, irrigation was not disturbed a lot. But after tubewell culture, a half pan system was totally abandoned. And much of the half pan system has been lost. And we are, you know, we are tapping the groundwater without any control. Nobody has control in the rural area. Just you put the borewell at 40 feet and you get water and you can draw, withdraw unlimited water. There is a contrast. For industry, we have a cap. That if you, if you are drying more than 10 KLD per day, then you have to take permission from Central, uh, from, uh, Central Groundwater Board and you have to pay sales for that. But in rural area, if for irrigation, whatever, whatever quantity of water you want to draw, you are free to draw. And I have seen that many agriculture fields near the river banks, they are being irrigated by groundwater. So that looks funny. The river water is available. But it, still, the irrigation is dependent on that of the groundwater. The reason is our, our selfishness, our ease, ease of, you know, ease of living, and going towards, because uh, groundwater is readily available, and you know, uh, electricity, you know, mostly free in the rural area. You just hook in the electric wire anywhere, and you, you can trap the energy and get the water. So this thing has to be regulated, and traditional systems should be modernized, and both of them should be amalgamated and then find a local area specific solution. That is my suggestion. Thank you. Yeah, I think and to add to what Asokji said, you know, uh, over dependence on, of ground, on groundwater in example on river sites could actually impact the river base flow as well because many rivers base flow is dependent on the local groundwater. Then, you know, groundwater also helps, uh, you know, stabilizing the land subsistence in many of the coastal Odisha and Deltai areas. So over overuse of groundwater in some of these areas actually causes land subsistence, land, uh, you know, uh, uh, subsistence as well as a lot of salinity inclusion in, in, in water systems. So I think, uh, you know, as, as I said before, it has to be an integrated approach. It, it, one resource is not, in, you know, not dealing from other resource. So each, uh, each system, each re resource is a, uh, is a, is a you know, uh, sort of a, an interlinked resource with the other, the entire ecosystem. So I think that in that way, we have to look for sustainable management of uh, groundwater. Yeah. So what it? You can, for that, you can go on uh, internet. You'll find the async practices of water. 
Uh, the Ranjan said already that if you Google, you'll get uh, lots of information about the traditional wisdom as far as water management is concerned. They're very easy nowadays to get uh, uh, information about traditional water management systems. Then one more question is there, if you are living in a concrete, concretized place, how we can build water secure future in small, yeah, that is a big problem, not all. And problem is aggravated by vertical buildings. Earlier, you know, mostly the, the buildings in the town uh, were constructed with single floor or two floors. And if a building had two floors, two families were living in an area of say 100 square meters. Today, in 100 square meter, eight story flats are there. And in place of two, one or two families, 20 families are living in there. And they're all withdrawing groundwater. So that is a big issue. And they don't they say that we don't have any surface for plantation and so on. But one thing can be done that is mandatory now in Bihar, that if you build any multi story building, you have to make the uh, provision for roof water, rain, rain water recharge uh, through the builder itself. That is one thing. And we, we should desist from uh, high rise buildings, in my opinion. Although the land is also scarce, but high rise buildings, they, took, they, they, they put lots of pressure on the groundwater. So if you ask me that, what is the solution for uh, the cities with lots of concrete jungle? I don't find a solution. The only solution is that for future, never go for this type of urban planning. The government has to come with some policy restricting the height of the building and also the distance between two buildings. The, 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 all the rules are there, but they're not being implemented in total. So if the rules, the building rules, biologists that are applied, the spread, further spread of concrete jungle can be blocked. But whatever concrete jungle is there, the only solution is there to put in water harvesting unit. Yeah. Done. Yeah, so we can conclude, I think. As we all have come to the end of the program, it gives me immense pleasure to thank each one of you for joining our program and making this event a success. I sincerely thank our key speakers, Mr. Panda and Professor Ghosh, for taking our time amidst their busy schedules. Also, I would like to extend my regards to the faculties and students from Patna Women's College for being a part of this integral program and being our guest in this auspicious day, in, uh, International Day of Water. Lastly, I extend my gratitude to Professor Prabhat Ghosh, my fellow colleagues and support team from the Asian Development Research Institute for all their support and encouragement. And uh, before we close our program and everyone uh, shuts their Zoom IDs, along with this uh, uh, International Day of Water, I wish everyone a very happy Bihar Divas or a Bihar Day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Devi Park. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Have yeah. a great day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir.